he was gone and supposedly never to return. With the absence of Muhammad Ali, deja vu hit as the World Boxing Association once again had to crown a champion. 10 years earlier in the late 60s, they held an eight-man tournament. This time around, the action revolved around four chosen youngsters, two of which were controversial South Africans, around which the WBA hoped to frame interest. They were ranked by the WBA numbers one, three, four, and five. Where's number two, you ask? It was the Black Destroyer, Ernie Shavers, who you may recall from the 70s timeline was busy staging his 1974 George Foreman impression of slugging away Ken Norton before losing a title bout against uh, I mean Larry Holmes. Point is, he had his hands tied pursuing the WBC strap. But imagine if he were in this tournament. Hmm. Number four ranked Leon Spinks was fresh off losing the big time against the shadow of Ali. He had the most to gain, perhaps. Number three ranked John Tate had just finished off Dwayne Bobbick, the man once believed to be the future of the division. Number five ranked Harry Katsia was unbeaten in the ring, but burdened by a bionic right hand though some claim it gave him an unfair advantage. Number one ranked Cali Canuzzi was on an 11 fight win streak since his loss to opposite end thinker Harry Casilla. Outside of the ring, he was a cop known for shooting a black protester at a 1977 rally. Whereas Casilla had addressed the blemish of apartheid, Kanutsi didn't seem to be in a hurry to take a stand against the injustice. Two sides of the South African coin and both sure to draw eyes and money to the Eliminator series in which South Africa could finally crown their first champion. Was it to be? Let's find out. Here's a timeline of the 1979 WBA Heavyweight Eliminator series. On cue, Kanutsi came out fast as Tate composed himself and stuck to boxing his opponent around the ring. Despite the crowd's reaction for every Kanutsi lunge and flurry, he wasn't doing much of anything else than wasting energy and feeding right into the patient Tate's game plan. Big John continued using his jab, mixing in rights, until Cali exploded into a crowd rising assault in the second. Tate remained poised and countered the eager Kanutsi, giving him something to think about. Kanutsi staged an even better flurry in the third that had the crowd anxious for the knockout, but he missed his window as once again, John Tate weathered the storm. Truth be told, Tate deflected many of the big blows as Callie wasted further energy and looked gassed to end the third. From the fourth on, Tate wore Kanutsi down and handed him a beating that showed under his right eye and from his nose bleeding. But Kanutsi never stopped coming forward. Callie had his last gasp in the opening minute of the eighth but ran out of gas as Tate teed off before the referee stoppage. Tate had Kanutsi dancing around the ring on instinct of survival. Kanutsi later claimed that Tate cracked his ribs, which would explain why he seemed so winded after the third. Perhaps. Up next, former undisputed champion Leon Spinks and Harry Katsia to determine who would join John Tate in the title bout. Contrary to the slow, methodical breakdown of Tate Kanutsi, Spinks Katesa was a firework. Spinks came out for the kill, swinging for the fences, but Katesa immediately capitalized with counters 
and dropped Spinks for the first time in his career. Face first at that. He answered and was decked again by the famous Kate Bionic Wright. He got up again and was forced to dance his way across the ring to the canvas a third time. Leon's recklessness had destroyed his chances of returning to the big time. Oh, that's all she wrote as it was waved off and Harry Katsia had stamped his ticket to the vacant WBA title bout against John Tate. It was quite the upset. Before they could get it on, however, Muhammad Ali had to officially retire and vacate the championship. Thankfully, this occurred the very next month and the bout was on, scheduled for October 20th. And the finale. The clash between the tournament's quick finisher and methodical drowner. The former, Harry Casilla, had home court advantage. Again, recalling a timeline of the 1970s heavyweight boxing division, this fight has gone down more so in history for its cultural impact surrounding apartheid in South Africa as opposed to it being a great or even good fight. Enough context, let's break down the fight. Once again, John Tate went about dancing. He was jumpy, slippery, doing his best Ali take. Kaysay spent the first chasing him and enticing audience reactions with flurries that did no damage, just as Kanetsi before him had done. The second saw the same with the addition of late round countering from Tate. The final 10 seconds of the third saw Kate land the bionic right and send Tate to the ropes, but the hurt man was able to tie up and survive another potentially deadly bionic right. The opening of the fourth once again saw Kate say unbalance Tate, his glove almost touching the mat as he fell back. After another right that caused him to nearly slip himself, Kate found himself on the retreat as Tate upped the pressure. A Tate right to the body seemingly made Kate nearly slip as he backed into a corner. Nearly. Tate spent the rest of the round familiarizing his right with Harry's face. Midway through the fifth, both men exchanged their best blows up to that point in the fight. Midway through the sixth, Tate appeared to land a right that dropped Kate Say, but it was ruled a slip. A replay revealed that the punch landed, but Harry slipped after the fact, and Tate almost landed a punch after the slip that would have gotten him disqualified. By the ninth, Harry had slowed considerably, and Tate was landing more as Kate Say was on the back foot. A strong right hurt Kate Say in the 11th, and Tate followed up by continuing to shove and lean his 240 pounds onto his opponent. Tate continued landing almost at will, slowing Kate Say with each blow. Defiantly, he tried hanging on and exchanging in the 12th with Tate, but was bested each time. The Tate rights became entire combos. In the 14th, Big John had Kate Say practically moonwalking at high speed to avoid his right, and it led to another slip for the South African. Kate Say may have been saved from a knockdown by the ropes in the closing seconds of the round as well. The 15th was do or die for Kate Say, who needed a knockout to win. Despite this, it was Tate who remained on the offensive. He closed strong, cornering and peppering Kate Say. Logically, Big John Tate was announced the winner by unanimous decision and was headed into the 1980s as the WBA heavyweight champion of the world. Hopes for unification with WBC champion Larry Holmes were high for the pending 1980. Whether it went through or not, however, is a story for another documentary that I am currently working on. Speaking of which, Perhaps it was the speed run of a backdrop and main event that propelled the division into the chaos that was the 1980s. 
so many fighters, but not enough time to build the blocks of any more true champions. You'll see what I mean. I hope you enjoyed this prelude to the Lost Generation. I'm still at work on the Lost Generation docuseries, haven't uploaded in a while, and I wanted to say thank you for the surge and support this past May. Amazing birthday present. Have no fear, I'm alive and well, and the videos will never stop unless I explicitly say so. Also, we're about 50 subs out from 500, meaning polls will be moving here. Also, would you like to see live streams dedicated to discussing the sweet science? Let me know. This has been TCJ, author of the Boxing Encyclopedia, and I'll see you next time. Stay frosty.